The reading is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 20, page 1089, if you're using one of the Bibles on the seats. John, chapter 20, beginning to read at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we pray that you will <coughs> lift any burdens that we are carrying, drive out any fears, wrong fears that are in our hearts, that your peace that peace that transcends all understanding might rest upon us. May your Spirit bring these words to our hearts and minds in a new, refreshing and deeper way that we might be strengthened in you and for you. Amen. Please do be seated and please do turn to John Chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, page 1089, if you're using the Bibles on the seats. You've got a handout there that you may find useful to you. It's also got questions at the end that you might want to take home and use to chew over what's been said. So we continue our series on the Holy Spirit. And here's a question I want to begin with. What does the world know of peace? According to um, one set of research, since 1 AD, there have been over 15,000 wars. What does the world know of um, peace? Before World War II, the world had an average of 2.6 new wars every year. But since World War II, despite all of mankind's combined efforts for world peace, there are now an average of three new wars each year. World peace seems unachievable. It seems to me that peace uh, as a word has become shallow uh, for us. Many people, when they think of peace, purely think of the absence of personal problems. And of course, that kind of peace can be induced by um, alcohol, TV, drugs, other forms of uh, escapism. But even that personal peace seems unattainable. There's a kind of mock peace in existence. There's really no peace at all. What do I mean by that? So that people will talk about having a, a sense of peace. But when you scratch below the surface, you'll just find that many people are hiding facts rather than dealing with them because the facts would disconcert them. People are hiding their fears rather than facing them because their fears would disturb them. And people are hiding their feelings instead of overcoming them because their feelings would just disrupt a sense of peace that they so are so anxious to have. So we talk of peace, and yet it's a precarious kind of peace at best. And then we think of our future, and fears drive away our peace. People don't understand who they are, where they are going, what they will do when they get there, if they get there, or as Max and Paddy summarize it in their song, don't know where we're going, got no way of knowing, driving on the road to nowhere. Now, we've not picked it up um, in our previous sermons because we were going to deal with it this evening, but twice already as we've looked uh, at Jesus' um, teaching on the Holy Spirit, he's spoken of peace in the context of sending the Holy Spirit. Just flick back to chapter um, 14. When we looked at the Holy Spirit as teacher, verse 25, 
and following, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. But then in chapter 16, just turn to chapter 16, when we spoke about the prosecutor and the guide, and at the end of that section, chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the peace that Jesus promises to his disciples enables them to sing even in suffering. This peace affects and even overrules conflict and difficult circumstances. So do you see the contrast? There's this mock peace that the world speaks of. It's a peace that says, look, I exist in the absence of war. I exist in the absence of worries. I exist when there's an abundance of wealth. That's the kind of peace, the mock peace that the world offers. And then the peace that comes from Jesus, the Prince of Peace, says, I exist in the presence of battles. I exist when life deals you a bitter blow. I exist even when the bank account is empty. It's a completely different kind of peace. It's an aggressive peace. You read all that the Bible says about this peace in John's Gospel. It's an aggressive peace that takes things on, battles things, overcomes things, subdues things. Now, the context for the words that Jesus spoke uh, is these troubled, this troubled team, hidden away, cowering in a locked room. Fear that the Jews were going to come and finish them off just as they'd finished Jesus off as gripped um, these ten disciples. I'm sure that they were sitting there in that room, convinced that peace could only come in if the trouble on the other side of the door stayed out. However, through locked doors, peace enters in. You see, whatever was going on in their hearts and minds, the lesson that Jesus wants to teach them is crystal clear. The risen Lord Jesus turns fear into peace, and he moves the disciples from being locked in to being sent out, driven out. You see, it's a peace that moves people out into conflict. The resurrection of Jesus and the receiving of the Holy Spirit results in peace and joy for these followers. That's what Jesus wanted for them. That is what Jesus wants for us as followers. He wants us to have peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that is different from the mock peace of the world. Just look again at verse 19. I'll start towards the end. Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Words of blessing. Peace be with you. Soothing words falling from the lips of the risen Jesus. Words that encourage those who are finding it difficult to believe and understand. Words that strengthen disciples, nourishing them when they feel weak. But he wanted to escape your uh, attention that twice this phrase appears, peace be with you, in such a short dialogue, drawing us in to look at what's enclosed between these two slices of peace bread. And then it is in verse 20 where we get the basis and the result of peace. Jesus shows them his hands and his side. Let's begin by thinking about the basis of peace that's promised. Why does Jesus show them his hand and side? Well, it's more than just to let them know he's alive. His presence there does that. You see, they're to understand that this is not just the risen Jesus. This is the crucified and risen Jesus. 
because it is only the crucified and risen Jesus and Him alone who can achieve peace with God for His followers. Crucified and risen, and therefore peace can be spoken. But how will this peace come to them? And how will this peace go out to others? Only through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus will send. The Holy Spirit will take the work of Jesus and apply it to the heart of the disciples so that they have peace. Yes, the Holy Spirit, who we've been thinking about over the last several weeks, the Holy Spirit, the prosecutor, who will convict the world in regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment, will also comfort the follower of Jesus, of Jesus with peace. He takes, some, he takes something out there, the objective work of Christ, what he achieved in his life, death, and resurrection, and he brings it in here and applies it to the heart of Jesus' followers. Redemption accomplished, and then the Holy Spirit, redemption applied to individuals. But let me say something of the, about the result of peace as well that was spoken of. Verse 20. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were <clears throat> overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The result is joy. Peace and joy work so closely together. Only the peace of God can change this fear and insecurity and anxiety of the disciples into joy and gladness. He speaks, peace be with you, and the disciples are over. Joyed. But perhaps you're just thinking at this point, but what is this peace that Jesus is talking about? What is this peace that results in joy? See, the peace that the Spirit brings believers is not merely the absence of stress or struggles or strife. You remember in chapter 16, the one I just read, don't turn to it, I'll just read it again. I have told you these things so that you um, so that in me you may have peace. Okay, we'd be happy with that. But then immediately Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. <sighs> I've told you this so you can have peace. In this world you will have trouble. We think, what well, trouble is the opposite of peace. You can't have peace if you're troubled, surely. See, they're going to be sent out into a warlike situation. Yeah, Jesus is not promising a peace um, like sitting, reading a good book, having peace and quiet that's escaped um, anybody who has children. Nor is he talking about that peace of positive thinking where you can bring about peace of mind through certain meditations. Nor is he talking about absence of troubles, living a peaceful life. No, this peace is something far richer, far more profound. As Paul says in Philippians, it's a peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that the world cannot grasp, cannot understand. See, at very least, there's so much that could be said on this, but at very least, this, this peace is an understanding and assurance and a confidence about how God is dealing with us in regards to past, present, and future. It's a peace to know that our past failings are consigned to the history books. In Jesus Christ and through His death, our sins are forgiven finally and forever. Sin cannot torment us about our failings. It's a great feeling, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever had it, whether you're students when you're studying for an exam or maybe you're working and you've got a, a deadline. And the, the work, the exam, the studying, the essay, um, the deadline, that whatever you've got to produce at work, and it weighs heavy upon you. And when the day passes, it kind of lifts and there's almost this peace, isn't there? And we just think, there's something happened there, something different. And Jesus says, because of the peace that I bring, the burden of sin has been lifted. And there's a liberation that comes to the heart and mind and the spirit. We know that we are forgiven. What a marvelous peace that brings joy to the heart. But in the present, what does it mean? Well, there's lots you could discover from John chapter 14 to 17. But again, in the present, we can call the God of the universe our Father. 
We can call the risen and reigning Lord Jesus Christ our brother and our friend. In the present, we can know peace in the midst of trial and joy in the midst of sadness. It's like, if I can take that illustration, it's like going into the exam or going into the office to present whatever work you've been done and knowing that it's not going to fail. Knowing that you will always overcome. That no matter what happens in that room, it cannot touch you. That's what we're talking about. A peace in the presence. An untouchable peace. A magnificent peace that brings with it joy. But it also is about having a secure future. A secure future in the presence of God for all eternity. So that we know where we're going. We know how we're going to get there. We know what we're going to do when we get there. It's like having those burdens lifted, knowing that we're untouchable, and at the same time recognizing that we've got an offer that is absolutely guaranteed of the best job ever. Doesn't that bring peace? A burden lifted, untouchable security, and a guaranteed future. That is the kind of peace that people really want. That is the kind of peace that people are craving after. People want a peace that deals with the past, where one where the cords of our sins are not used to create a whip by which to torture us by hour, hour by hour. We want a peace that governs the presence with no unsatisfied desires gnawing at our hearts. We want a peace that holds promise for the future, where there's no foreboding fear of the unknown or dark tomorrow that threatens us. And this is the peace that Christ has accomplished and that the Spirit applies to the hearts of those who believe in which guilt of the past is forgiven, the trials of the present to overcome, and in which our destiny and future is secured eternally. And that is no small thing. Because knowing that and having those things applied to our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, that is what enables Christians to say to people, scoffers, well, you can keep your holidays at homes in Spain, or to Alan Sugar, look, you can keep your millions. Because through faith in Jesus Christ and through His indwelling Spirit, God has given me His peace. And that peace is greater than all that the world pursues. You have nothing to offer me that can supplant this peace. Past, present, and future. See, it's a peace that enables us to embrace trials and suffering, not with a cold reluctance, but with a confident resolve that they will not touch the peace that God has granted us. See, this peace, when I was growing up um, in church, um, we used to have this traditional thing where they, during communion services, you say, peace be with you. I never really knew what was going on. Um, people like would try and get you, often the old ladies would try to kiss you, but I was part of this old church that had um, Jacobean box pews that you could lock. So as a teenager, I just locked myself at the end of the pew so that no one can get to me and give me this peace um, that I didn't want. You see, this peace is not a weak, wet, woolly greeting that does nothing for the followers of Jesus. This peace is a firm focused, fold, guarantee that nothing can touch the peace that Christ grants. You see, this peace comes by the Spirit and it turned this troubled team into a tenacious team. The disciples quickly realized that the Lord's will for them is not that they sit back, put their feet up, thinking how good it is to be a Christian and enjoy this peace. His peace doesn't mean passivity. The peace that they have come to participate in must be a peace that is proclaimed. Look at the second half of verse 21. Well, I'll read it all. And again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
Jesus now passes on the baton to his disciples. It's now up to them and us to continue the mission of Jesus. Having received peace, we now become peace proclaimers, isn't it? Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Intrinsically linked. Mary, in the opening bit of chapter 20, you've got Mary. She had this um, micro mission, I call it. She was told to take the news of the risen Jesus to the disciples. Uh, Jesus basically looked, it can't stay with you, this news of the peace that I have brought. You take it to the disciples. Then the disciples have got a macro mission. Jesus says, look, this news of peace can't stay with you. You've got to take it to the nations, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And then we have got a micro mission, M-Y. It can't stay with us. We've got to take this peace and we've got to proclaim it to my crowd around me, my community, my contacts. It couldn't stay with Mary. It can't stay in a locked room in Jerusalem. And it can't stay with us. The peace that we have received must be proclaimed. It's a peace that takes us out into a war zone, into conflict. Oh yes, we're not up to the job in and of ourselves, but the risen Lord Jesus, when he returns, as we've looked each week in this series on the Holy Spirit, will send the Spirit, the Counselor. Verse 22 is a foreshadowing of um, the great day when the Spirit will arrive at Pentecost. Spirit is given for the task of proclaiming the risen Jesus. The Spirit is given so that forgiveness and peace can be proclaimed. And that same Spirit who dwells within us, applying that peace to our hearts, is given that we might be peace proclaimers. But what is this peace that we are to proclaim? Well, there's again much that could be said, but let me highlight three areas. There is peace between us and God. That's why the Father sent the Son. God makes peace with us by substituting His Son's suffering for our penalty so that God approaches us, those which are in Christ, no longer as a wrathful judge, but as a loving Father. There is peace with God. There was once enmity. We were once enemies of the living God. But through Christ, there is peace. There's peace between us and others who are in Christ. To be reconciled to God is to be reconciled to all those who have been reconciled to God. There's no hostility, not only vertically, <clears throat> peace with us and God, but also horizontally. Paul picks this up about the Jews and the Gentiles, doesn't he? He's made the two one. He's taken down the dividing wall of hostility so that there's peace. Peace between us and God. Peace between us and other people who are in Christ. But also, there is peace between us and our own souls. In the New Testament letter to the Hebrews in chapter 9, it says this, The blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. Isn't that a precious peace? The peace of a clear, cleaned conscience. How many people are burdened under the weight of a defiled, murky, guilty conscience. Charlotte Bronte um, said this, I envy your peace of mind, your clean conscience, your unpolluted memory. Little girl, a memory without blot of contamination must be an exquisite treasure, an inexhaustible source of pure refreshment, is it not? It is. And all Christians who've had that peace applied to them through the Spirit know it. We understand what it is to have a clean conscience before God because the blood of Christ has cleansed us. Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, purchased peace. Now through the indwelling Spirit, we practice and proclaim peace. We proclaim that through Jesus and his indwelling spirit, there is peace between men and God. There's a peace that can be had. And people don't know of it. 
until we proclaim it. That there is enmity between them and God, but there is peace. They can have peace with God. We proclaim that through Jesus and His indwelling Spirit, there can be peace with one another. Harmonious relationships, as people are united in Christ, the only one who can bring a, an end to such hostility. We proclaim that through Jesus and His indwelling Spirit, we can have inner peace, a clean conscience. The peace that the Spirit brings calms the disconcerted, comforts the disturbed, and composes those who are disrupted. And this is the peace that Jesus gives, accomplished by His work and applied to our hearts by the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, where would we be without such peace? There is no wonder that in that room the disciples were overjoyed upon seeing the Lord and hearing these words twice spoken to them, peace be with you. Simple words with such depth, such wonder, such power. Through your Spirit, may we increasingly know the strength of that peace in our lives. And may we go forth boldly to proclaim that peace that can be had through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.